thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Steve, for inviting me. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing stuff now. And uh, I'm so glad some old friends, some very old friends, made it tonight. Um, not, uh, anyway, so um, I, I'm going to read some from this book that is not that new, but is somewhat new. And then some new poems. Can you hear me okay? Should I move the mic? Or? Yeah, so okay. um, the book is called Some Worlds from Dr. Vogt. And if you feel like you don't know who Dr. Vogt is, uh, rest assured that I don't either. <laughs> um, but I have some speculations if you want to uh, ask them later. Um, it's a long poem made of little poems and uh, split up by some epigraphs. I'm going to read a few sections. Um, and the first section uh, begins with a, a, a line that I took as an epigraph from uh, an essay of uh, Malevich's, and, uh, where he says, each form is a world. Eucalyptus leaves stir a slow tremble outside the automobile factory. There is a world an image undisturbed by speech, the article missing from the gates, VW crossing the plaid field. You could say a vision, but you don't. There is a world, a repetition undisturbed by rhyme. The soccer player breaks his ankle thanks to the game he loves, small sacrifice. Poor trees knowing so little of their tragedy to sway, to shake in the wind, to soft and bow. On what field of vision does the horse graze on fallen pine needles? Where is the man welding green light by the glowing pink cross on the corner? There in a world, a relation unknown, unhindered by the vast potential of introspection, truck full of cane, a truck full of laborers, factory road, sugar on this side, beer on the other, graffiti, farms, fire by the color, keeps down the brush, hawk, Crests a telephone wire, circle culture. White egret jutting out of the marsh where cattle leave little to the earth. Is it bone below the bark? As sight cools into sound or digs into sound, dog cools off in the lagoon, Andante digging in the piano. There's a world, and if you had seen it at the beginning, you'd have seen it begin. If you had seen it begin, you would know how it felt to be nothing becoming something. But now you are everything becoming nothing to speak of. A limit bearing down, approaching zero as a towel dries, as a tire degrades, as a coinage dissolves, into, first into cliché, then idiom, ceasing to be the thing and leaving only meaning to swallow it as time swallows the rocks or moves them. A world in the revolutionary moment, in a hammock, a gilded ballroom in the hollow of a violin hidden under the lid of a piano. Did you need to say black, say shiny, say grand? The image, no more labor for the mind. The piano you fail to note is broken. Imagine the dust, if you want, add spiders. In this intimate conversion of telling you a world, the gate drawn Within, with a curtain, the column rebuilt, the jail reconstructed to be locked again. Where did you go wrong? At the same time, the plastic bottle feels in your hand the same as the wind feels in the branches of the spindly pine or the rain in the fronds of the palm. Delta waters in the mangrove roots. The bite of an insect, the bite of distilled spirits, compare these things. There is a world in the comparison between souls an argument amidst trees to name them botany or worse. The threads of the screw last only so long. Bolts and hinges also come loose. Here in the bloom, the hummingbird prevails. The golden bee hovers. The air bears down on the canopy as furniture music. A wall of glass 
almost accurate as a leaf follows the sun, its veins an argument against the bark or the word for its escape from it, in a net, in a country, in the fray. To counter a vision, the draftsman moves his elbow along a line. Type falls into place by way of pneumatic tubes, and far away behind the page there is a world, an administrative error, a disjunction no longer visible on the horizon in serifed grasses or reeds of a swamp, the chair in the sand never upright. Somewhere between serpent and eagle there is a world or a relativity. It hangs there, humming a tune like St. James Infirmary, St. Louis Blues, or When the Sun Goes Down. The wind cools you, but why the coffee lukewarm? Long waves of ignorance wash over your toes. The swimmer leans into the current, dries in the wind. Between is a world of shadow, the alphabet follows, the rule of the letter, smell the copper, dust under the graver, the scent of black, wove paper and nitric acid in the rough basement. Take it to a mirror or let this mirror come to touch everything that exists in order to be crammed into a book, even metaphysics, even hips. See how it's bound at one edge suggesting entrance or what is said is done. What's left of this world is color, the flapping pulp, transparent white, the turning of a page, a minute, a new year. When the fishermen throw their nets, there is a very quiet applause and sometimes a giggle, hardly auditory, like the gap between two insect landings on the map of the empire. This part um, of the book is just one poem, a longer, slightly longer poem, uh, with an epigraph from Williams Patterson. Outside, outside myself, there is a world. So, posing a line, in repose, passing the time instead of time passing, you may contemplate some meaningful coherence, even now fragmented into segments, as a shoulder jutting from behind a garden urn on which it leans hair attached backwards as spider legs to make a fragment of a head, a face turned away, never to be more than image, imagined in expectation, i.e. a contemplated form, the more seductive thereby promise of meaning. It's beautiful constructs, or a way of putting it, doesn't in the end matter, line wrestles with words and means in the glade or shade of cool grotto until worn out where it breaks at a point over the hills with tradition as the surveyor folds the tripod of his scope over a bee in the grasp of an ant in the dirt as as points to a simultaneous resemblance unfilled unconsummated yet reciprocal all consuming in its decor a drowsy line in lieu of a revised totality in sunlight's daytime sense, a line then at leisure to describe as an unright the shape of a day off, a pattern not for sake of art, to celebrate a Sabbath that is useless to this world of labor relations, useless to you too now, following the line with a working finger, that is a finger that has been made by time to represent your work entire occupation, nimble, severe, its rings of skin, etched crosshatch, half moon over a frayed horizon, tell of the wash of waste. Outside, where nothing cuts, nothing joins, someone is calling on this phone as if a line tethers to the world, whereas in fact it circumscribes another. It's for you, doctor. I'll read part of another section. Is everybody asleep? No. Yes. <laughs> um, this one's 
this section starts with a, a little snippet from an early poem of Edmund Jabez. Um, the term, the foreworld, gone from care. There is a world different from any other that is happening now, occurring in order to push this world into the past. The cadaver climbs toward other astronomies beyond the bed and the bath, like blood from a rock, wine, jura, distant mind, a call for papers in white plains, serifs advertise fast food at the rest stop, hands over the mouths as over the lens. The changes play to skipping, a record of failure to meet the world, an infinite refrain falls over the writing hand. Pose a world as a tautology or an equilibrium, a state of balance or static, something like the river flows, already redundant. What, in fact, is its shape? For instance, someone gave you this beer so you can't do anything about it. You can drink it as long as you stand relatively still, describing to yourself the view or the way the tree trunks lay in the northern woods, leafless then, save for the ground cover, so that vision is not a noun, but the unachievable form of the verb reading, legere, Greeks choose to speak, Romans pick through the ruins. All this is well known, but bears repeating. Cherry blossoms in the rain, the season's emotional efficacy. To chew the crust, another way to bite down. Even the shapes of eros, you know, are finite. Ready-made as in ready-to-wear, nails like mushrooms with their floppy caps or Chinese hats, the body, cracked flesh of synthetic putties and adhesives. Where's the cookie tin, the linoleum, chosen origin of what world cast legs and torso down the stairs more than once, shard to diamonds or gibbons, for instance, a gray mustache, almost 50 and still remembers something, tugs hoodie down, pulls up his denim, packs cigarettes hard against a white palm. An ant, a particular variety, scurries over pitted marble. A girl in clean black coat in crisis over the absence of a Starbucks. What is this world? Who are these people? Trees leaf while mountains shimmer. An architecture of bumpy triangulation pulling their weight up to a taper. Outside the freezing, there is a world that may never come. A farce of bounded visions, imperial nostalgia. A rhythm or a slide through a wheel. All the insides spilling forth and outside the furniture is taken to the streets. Set up makeshift shop to counter the movement of numbers. To couch the specter of concepts to be outside the period, waiting what won't come, as if at a wake backward, watching the horizon for the event, or vice versa. The ground literally swells, heaves like ocean, breathes like air, forgetting its previous location as one forgets one's phone number, one's own face. Worlds begin with oblivion. So I'll probably need like eight minutes or so from <laughs> this uh, new, newer work I've been writing for the last couple of years. Um, a, for now, uh, titled From a Winter Notebook, and, and it has a very simple conceit, uh, which you'll hear pretty obvious. And most of the book, the first line, or some of the book, I guess, if it becomes a book, um, the first line will have uh, the word winter in it, and sometimes I'm, well, I'm working on a uh, part of the book that may have the word winter in the last line of each poem. Other than that, they're quite different from each other in some ways. Um, anyway, I'll just read a few of them. And the winter does nothing 
for the question of equilibrium. I answered with trees swaying and raised a zero above shoulders to indicate that nothing is equal to infinity on all sides. I wore my zero as a hat and as a badge of honor awarded for not doing anything at all. I keep in mind a feeling of holding your crotch in the palm of my hand. This gives me solace a comfort at knowing something completely without study, endlessly open. Where the body turns, it can ache, splitting easily apart. A terrible way to go, but I can't write to you about this, so I write to you about zero. I never asked to be winter colored, just as I've gained no interest laying my claims to genocides of my peoples. And though I was nearly exterminated when I make for a cafe with light friends, I don't worry. The owner's arms of private property somehow extend to shield us paying patrons while we are. Such times I briefly feel atop a world that turns for each, though not for everyone. In this slant light, forgetting edges, I assume my rounded seat at my imagined table. It's like my name, a gift of God, to sign it in the margin of the luxury to choose. It's winter and the rhymes are poor. Recuerdo de Santiago, Recuerdo. In my, in my mind, I'm touching your haughty knee, like a male, no? My ear completely in your mouth, I dwell upon the element of context, moonstone, channel five, a cave unlocked, a moat, a not-eye door, me squeaking. As any ear a conch becomes to hear the swelling sea, so your tongue ceases to be tongue, a snail fitting into curves, of shadow as shale conforms its purring to the swale. Slow time pours out empathy no vessel can be whole enough to carry on its sliding journey. The envy of sound in the cough, <clears throat> the envy of sound in the cough, like the sad squeal of the fan that's violently unplugged, or smell of paper in the paperback, the empty whispered promise of documentary persuasion. Here the voice rests, top heavy as the pines, laden with heavy plum-like pendulums of pine cones once squirrels have gleaned for shucking lower branches. There's no one to talk to. Springs of the mattress pinch my inner life, childhood shamed and useless in the moonlight. The snail has long ago returned. Now tongue is tongue and ear is ear. The fan comes on and time is back to rushing. The squirrels sleep where no one can see them. Your secret dried now, like the trace of waves along the sand, dead sea, greens left behind, and shame of having loved too briefly that long, wet winter silence. Art is long and winter longer. Kidding myself, thinking that there's politics in your desire or economic collapse in this poetics. It's profitable more to paint than let everyone see your meaning. The poem's emptiness isn't about blankness. Voice emancipates itself of original voice, first impulse. Your smell is on my pants where you sat and rubbed yourself and shook. When you're not there, it's no surprise. All sons are equal to themselves. Unlike bodies, I've been in all these shoes, untied. <clears throat> in winter, at an outdoor amphitheater, there's nothing on the stage, but we find our seats just the same and take them. The year is Greece, the place is distant, present, or past perfect, if you like. Perfect melancholy of the artist couple, taking in the sights, played well and after. There is tenderness in front of the TV, but something's missing, my erection. Believe me, it's out of mind's control, such intellectual passion. Why fleeting, friend? 
you leave no note but dishes in the sink, junk jewelry, a toothbrush. The scent lingers longer than the body stays. Winter might pray to green trees to see the star that brings a season in which I sit metastasizing in my briefs by the breeze of a blue fan with some same complaints so that if you came upon me there now, you would not recognize me, but it's me. The curve of my back, same emails, same friend, requests ignored. Should I give up? For Martians, don't speak through me. I'm observing this lack of purpose proliferate in my cell walls. My whole awareness is of distraction. Doubt the erotic verse will get me a residency, or exile on the Black Sea where I'd stare at brutal resorts built over the beach. Can't say I'm fond of this coercion, but every night I try to do something meaningful and break what keeps coming back. So I tie up a sack and anchor a word to the bottom of water. It's a syntax, but it's not a life. Thank you very much. Calculations on International Women's Day. Financial aid has more to do with being a poet than many want to admit. What can I say? I talked on the phone with Matthew and Taylor about their assistantships, the new structure, the per credit price, and said, I think these changes are good. And to be honest, I do think that, because when does tuition ever go down? But it's still not free. I'm always working, but I had a choice. So I laid on the couch and read, it's no good. Then I got up and started to write this. It was the opposite of striking. At the reading the day before the strike, the strike, <laughs> Pearl said when he translates, he of course 
tries to do the best job possible as far as literariness and faithfulness to the original, but at the same time, in any translation, there is, of course, a critique of the notion of private property, and this is the aspect that he likes very much. The fact that anyone can take his work and do something else with it, the cultural and political import of that phenomena is what attracts him. Kirill's translation practice began with Bukowski, a different figure in Russia, I think, almost Sylvia Plath. <laughs> I never know what to say when a young femme poet names Bukowski as influence or obsession, but almost invariably the writing turns out to be good. I can't claim this is a translation of Kirill's translation of Bukowski or the way Bukowski appears in Kirill's early poems as translated by Keith Gesson back into English as Bernadette Mayer, but I can suggest it. So friends, hold the bloody sponge up for all to see. The bedpan they turned over and propped me up with for a pelvic exam, pelvic exam because the room didn't have a bed with stirrups. The fear a doctor would say, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just constipated. Something I've been told before. Sometimes that was true. The handy person always blames tampons when the pipes back up and leak sewage in the basement. Saturday before the strike, I went with my husband to a philanthropic gala to benefit the theater that pays his wages. We took Lyft to a large hotel on a hill, recently purchased and renovated by the Wyndham Group. People say the hotel is haunted, and the tunnels beneath it from Prohibition run all the way to Shattuck. The gala began with a reception from corporate sponsors in a formerly private room built by the backer of the hotel, who once half-climbed Everest, and built the room in homage, as the concierge put it, to that culture. The walls of the room are blue, deep, and Aegean. Its windows look out over the bay at a swimming pool below. One corporate sponsor noted it must have been a little cold to swim. Another thought the pool was heated. To this, I added, it's always nice to swim in a warm pool of water. While clouds move across the land, pushing cold air before them, driving rain onto your head. As we spoke, palm trees were waving around in the wind. This caused me to get carried away. The palm trees inciting my observation repeated several times throughout the night that this deep blue room, looking out as it does on a green vista, evoked the subject of that evening's money, the theater, exactly. In 2003, Kerrville refused to participate in literary projects organized or financed by government or cultural bureaucrats. He refused all public readings. And in 2004, gave up copyright of his texts so, uh, and said he could, in fact, have no such right, but nonetheless forbade the publication of his texts in anthologies or other collections. They could only be released as pirated editions without his permission, without contracts or agreements. In 2005, his poems were full of people on the street and in the train station, full of fantasies between people in dense public spaces in Moscow, his homeland. How one hates the people who destroy one's homeland, who come in with containers, stack them, install glass doors, and sell smoothies. The poems from 2005 remind me a little of Paris Spleen or A Season in Hell, except his baby son is there too, and intellectual girls with sharp tongues, the kind he likes. Like the middle-aged billing receptionist, it was hot in her office, but she couldn't remove her jacket because she'd worn the wrong bra. I could see it beneath her shirt, bright pink. I had the urge to show her mine or trade. Instead, I said, that's fashion. That's fashionable. We laughed together at the Blue Shield website down again. She couldn't log in, and she could. You know how it is. Women in phenomenal women t-shirts, Diane von Furstenberg photoshopped on the Empire State Building, proud to be a woman, women on unicycles juggling babies, clocks, houses, and bills, women shutting down ice in the satin jackets of girl gangs, women in public transit in red berets, holding a copy of Gloria Steinem's book, Gloria, editorial photographs of women in vast white, tall, face down in fields of red flowers, clouds seen from a plane, a red square, a woman's work is never done. Is this okay or is it kind of bouncing? Okay, okay. Um, my Fascism was an essay about the relation of politics and art in 2004, how some artists on the far right had made a powerfully vital and dangerous art. It's doubtful, Kirill writes, that fascism in our time will still be a cult of everything pseudo-classical, black, shiny, and militarized, even if its essence remains the same, the cult of tradition, irrationalism, anti-intellectualism, elitism, the conspiracy theory, and a reliance on the failing middle class. Everyone has his or her own fascism. My fascism is the fatal inability to understand and accept everything falling outside not only humanity, but my own personal humanity. It's my attempt to hang on to various ghosts instead of admitting that Though we're still filled with shards of the old culture, we're standing now on bare ground. We don't just not have classical music anymore, 
or literature or poetry. We don't even have Duchamp's urinal. In Russia right now, we're all Frankensteins, pieced together from various dead traditions. The maximum that we have right now is air. I thought about Pepe. Gender, a dead tradition. Still, I wanted not to put myself in the care of anyone else's labor on a hunger strike day. It was the least I could do. And I didn't, on a day without women, get my groin waxed. But I would have canceled that appointment anyway. It was a mess down there. In the waiting room, Monday before the strike, in tunnels between the buildings and new and old parts, one woman kneeled on linoleum. She was going in and out. I hoped the plastic chair was cool against her face and noticed blood leaking from her port. I thought we might be about the same age. I wondered if my port was leaking. I couldn't bring myself to look. It was better than Golden Gate Urgent Care, I can say. With its seven antibiotics for seven diagnoses, its human algorithmic workers, which may or may not be better than what is coming, than what has been, or what it is like right now. My friend gets healthcare on the extension of an extension. We have the same coverage. Kirill and I almost shared the same birth year, the same generation, but different. He gets sick at least once in those poems in the hospital with a sophisticated and dangerous chronic form of yellow fever. Self-sufficiency and dignified aloofness, also qualities foreign to me. In the introduction, it's no good. Keith Gesson says Kirill's early work was denounced in some circles as self-indulgent, not poetry, so on. It was bad enough for a poet not to rhyme, but to discuss at length how he found some cheap pate in an expensive supermarket. And not as a metaphor for anything. He was just mostly pleased to have found some cheap pate. It was too much or too little. He buys a condom to collect a urine sample from his son. As the doctor suggested, he's supposed to put it on the penis, then secure it to the baby's waist with a string. Some urethras do not extend to the tip. Some bladders don't close completely or the outlet is narrowed or the opening of the urethra appears in another place. I guess you could say I did a good job at the gala. The development consultant said I wasn't natural. Someone should slap a name tag on me. She praised my dress and I've been waiting for the chance to confess its price, $27, where I got it, Forever 21. <laughs> I'm not sure if the concierge meant Tibet or the Himalayas or climbing culture, but I substituted one after another of these things as I related to corporate sponsors and board members the anecdote of the backer and his room built for private parties and homage to the photo everyone recognized of Sir Edmund, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norge. I can't deny its elegance, that room. I could have stayed there for a long time while the crowd drifted on. Eating from a platter of baked brie with a slab of honeycomb dripping above, a slice of honey is set on its side in a wooden frame, lit from behind, and looking, as the wife of the best friend of a corporate sponsor said, like a guillotine. Yeah. But I left the room after all, and on my way, put the heel of my shoe through the lace of the dress, almost tripping and falling, and leaving a tear that droops all the way to the silent auction of wines and cruises, to the photo booth, and my seat at dinner next to the wife of a board member, who turned out to be a person of my class, an adjunct faculty at the same college who worked for a long time at the Alameda, Alameda Labor Council, and so I learned a lot that long, boozy night, the names of people who were serving the food, that Sutter used to be a public hotel, hospital, <laughs> that phone banking, an idea I have dismissed loudly at many union meetings is a useful strategy, and someday soon we'll have a phone bank at our house. It'll build capacity. She ignored and talked through all the speeches, many about storytelling and its special value in this moment. She clapped loudly for the Luminary Awards given to recipients of the theater's community engagement. Her name is Sharon, and I spent enough time with her face I could see each of its ages present and the one before me. Does it matter in the end I got credit for this? You know how it goes. Sharon is usually bored at the gala, so everyone was pleased she had someone to talk with. And Sharon and I got something from it too. I missed my friend's poetry readings that night. I heard later that Leora read a poem about her very insist bursting. Sometimes I can't think, sometimes I think, what can I possibly say about anxiety and having a body that my friends haven't already? Yeah. Other times I wonder why there aren't 50 different books on this subject. 100 books about feminist bookstores, 500 about their health collectives. And there's a lot to be said about ovarian cysts. Their drawing on the internet is really disgusting. They bleed sometimes within their own walls and other times into the abdominal cavity. At the end of the night, a costume designer whose work I respect said she'd been admiring my dress all night and I didn't miss the opportunity to say once more how much it cost, where it came from, and I must have known her face would wrinkle and hesitate. She started to say, but before she could finish her sentence, I was pretty loose now and emphatic. 
it all comes from a little bit of shit, <laughs> gesturing wildly towards the, board, towards the ballroom, all of it, blood and shit. And then I saw Sharon dancing in her husband's arms to some mid-century surf song. At the reading the day before the strike, Kirill said frankly surprising things during the Q&A. When Micheline asked as someone who's been living under an authoritarian regime, now that we live in these new American times, new and not so new, but definitely unavoidably we're facing them as an artist and a writer yourself, and what can you tell us, what ought we to do? I mean, we're writers and we live here in this empire and we're facing our own situation. By the time I traveled from the waiting room to the, to the triage doctor, to the billing receptionist, to the CAT scan room, to ultrasound, back again to the waiting room, holding my urine sample in a plastic bag for everyone to see, my husband was there and the other woman's husband was there and they must have gotten off work at the same time. She leaned against his body, going in and out, while we watched The Bachelor on waiting room TV. And I contained my symptoms because I was afraid I was afraid they would say, after all, I was just constipated, and later realized this is how I gave up my shot at at least one dose of opiates. <laughs> they called her back to the ER at the same time, and we entered with our husbands on a kind of double date, the club lousy with pretty handsome young people who put us in facing rooms. Hers had a curtain that went around the bed, but mine had a doctor that got there faster. Our husbands were really annoying to the nurses, to everybody, hers complaining loudly about how long they'd been waiting. I thought he was going to hit someone. I could hear her moaning across the hall. I don't know her name, but we have the same coverage. That's what her husband told mine. She works at Target. Her husband tried to get her on his insurance instead and couldn't, which is our situation as well. Still, I felt guilty every time a doctor came to my room and not hers. The nurse seemed most annoyed at my husband when they were about to prop me up on the bedpan. I sent him into the hall. They got the speculum in for a minute, but it popped back out. I'm not sure what happened to her. If she left after we did, at midnight, or if they admitted her, her husband said she hadn't taken a shit in days. Her face was so sweaty. I hated the way the doctors seemed so grossed out when they left her room, and I'm guessing they were pretty grossed out when they left mine. The cyst is four by six centimeters, the kind that bleeds into itself, not the abdomen, spreadsheet, heating pad, ibuprofen. In 2012, Kirill wrote, if you're having some problems or feeling sad, I recommend you take a weekend evening and go with a group of anti-fascists to Mianitskaya Street next to the Mumu Cafe. I suspect he's right. Now it is next week, and Kellyanne Conway said she's not Inspector Gadget. She doesn't believe people are using microwaves to spy on the Trump campaign. <laughs> Gender, a dead, a dead tradition. My translation runs so far behind, it leaves out most of the book and doesn't account for difference. Maybe it's called Everything's Bad. I think it's better than Keith Gessen's, pieced together with mine like Frankenstein, but no, I'm joking, you should definitely read It's No Good, translated by Keith Gessen. It's just that for these purposes, I have to swagger good-naturedly. I have to change my mind. Welcome, Alan Bernheim. How's the sound? Good? Good. Okay, somebody wave if it dips below audible. Thanks, Steve, and it's a real pleasure to read. The Stephanie and Mate, as well, and to see so many friendly faces in the audience. Thank you all for coming out. Those of you who don't know, we'll get to be friends afterwards. History of happiness. Just did the math, too bird's eye for me, living by wits. Miss out what's said. Travel size heart throb, gravity situation. Confess stupid alibis. Unemployed emotions keep healthy distance, showy brushwork, rakish dogma, skirmish in the archives. Equanimity overrated, all puffed up, Homer at home. Sorry for what clumsy miscues put miles in air, up for the count. Hero worship, had away with clouds. Call it a truce, misery loves misery. Dispatch collusion units. What mood says, disappearing zeros, tiny white flecks, world's worst blank animal episode, next undercurrent. Words mean everything, put skids under you, waiting for emptiness to fill with thought, thought with words. 
would be has been racking up karma, not the dense out for extra oomph. Every element something to someone, smoke in the shade, naughty or naugahyde, spasms of youth, dead for a ducat. Curious gray eyes would be my department, touching another drop. People want to be spoken to as snowflakes, settle down to business, top dog hot tub party, got the burg closed up, author's compliments, magpie fragment, be a nuisance, the long meow. <laughs> Breakfast. Forgetting words the moment you hear or read them is one way to avoid plagiarizing, but just keep their flavor and then try expressing that in your own words, as if you could own words. You can't even keep thoughts from slipping away. <clears throat> They're the slipperiest of all the slippery things in life. The hotel elevator that rises way past the roof and slips across a higher landscape, a different neighborhood. Why not ask if any of these places will be open for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> the truth about more. Every man is an intellectual whose words can be exchanged for cash. Mothballs dissolved in vodka anesthetize the agent. Only the mercury is true. How can I believe in that social world of tone, metal and celluloid novelties? Philosophy should come out to play. A guy with imagination gets pictures in his head, like there's no tomorrow, a word that means itself. The red patches on black are visible as the whales tango through the waters of the lagoon. The new sentience. It feels great being any place, replete with exterior decor, secret springs of action, head airing out inside scenery. Life's passage was never going to be fearless, and abundance of caution behooves not backing leg shows. You didn't have to be square to resist cubism. Every building claims it was a brothel. We march monarchy carefully through the trepidation of society, the past unspools beneath. Lunch for two, dinner for six, alive with pithful words of swim. Alive with pithful words and thrilling ones of swim. You need any help with the coffin, it's going to be feathery till she comes to. This is the delicatee section. That Next few works all have dedications. The first is for Bill Berkson, Futurama. The difference between truth serum and asterism, the dark of the matinee, and fathomably lovely dirigible shadow moving at dirigible speed across the 1920s Oakland Tribune facade a year ago today. Apartment life with caper delivery just around the cornice maybe Monk in Oslo, and elevator men at this remove. Shoot hooky for Jason Morris. Man talking to Sky. What you gotta do, aim at the eyes. It is possible that suspense never ends, make bed, lie in it. No matter laughing, everything but the molecule people don't appreciate the substance of things. I look like someone you've met more in the past, wading through caftans, as though hating it, who believe in misty ways, would bet my depot, or use much backup, long since lost the plot. Many stars and ones perpetually shooting for Ali Warren. Eyes have it for the dream sequence at weepy random lengths gone to, wasted years so close behind. Now what about rhyme detection completes yourself by proxy, identity parade in footloose stride, and already beams coming out of my ears don't show stored form warning. 
I've got all day with least astonishment. It's nothing to turn around and go back two or three miles to cross your T's. Everybody looks at the sky. Their name is Susan. Tell us about your loot. <coughs> the loot, not the <laughs> not my loot. <laughs> Protected witness for Aaron Simon. You want to look good in green your whole life, crisp and cryptic. Not a person who can't spend change or act like a pronoun, any good at smiling. A little oblivion goes a long way with immense solos cluttering terrains, but current stuff is lots more fun, too busy to be human, one more at a time. Seals sleeping. Seals sleep as they sink in the sea. Seals sleeping underwater then waking up. How seals sleep with only half their brain. Seals sleeping stock photos. <laughs> half awake seals help explain sleep disorder. How does seal team six get to sleep? <laughs> seals sleeping between the rock stock footage. Elephant seals sleeping royalty free. <laughs> Max ear seals earplugs. Crab eater seals still sleeping. Apnea ashore and at sea. <laughs> Madness seals the deal for sleeping with sirens. Sleeper sharks snag sleeping seals. Diving seals and meditating yogis. Sleeping seals and stone chats. Nice marine seals sleeping on the snow in Antarctica. Seals, wall art, and home decor. Some of those are tongue twisters. And finally, I want to read a chapter from uh, Lost Profiles, uh, memoirs uh, by, memoir by Philippe Sapo that I translated the City Lights published last fall. For those who don't uh, know it, it's a, a series of uh, short prose sketches of people he knew in Paris in uh, the teens and twenties. Uh, people like Apollinaire, uh, Reverdy, Sundarars, um, unexpected ones like, for me anyway, like Marcel Proust and James Joyce. And the uh, one I want to read tonight is, is Rene Crevel. Uh, Cornel Crevel was a, a surrealist poet who was called the Golden Boy of Surrealism, devastatingly handsome. Uh, he took his own life at age 35 in 1935, uh, suffering from uh, illness uh, and un irreparable conflicts between uh, his loyalty to Breton, Andre Breton, who had drummed him out of surrealism for being bisexual in 1923, later he rejoined the group, but uh, it was not friendly uh, towards anyone that wasn't straight. The group, uh, his loyalty to communism, fierce loyalty to communism, the conflicts that were going on between communism and surrealism at the moment, uh, it just became untenable. Anyway, here he is, Rene Crevel. One night, Rene, Rene Crevel and I were walking along the caves of the Seine at the beginning of autumn. Rene was talking very fast, as he always did. I stopped in my tracks before one of the trees that graced the riverbanks. It had leaves no bigger than a hundred Sioux coins. The wind, so gentle that we hadn't even noticed it, shook the little leaves, and the tree seemed to tremble. There's a tree like you, I said to Crevel. He readily agreed. All in all, I think I was not mistaken. Rene Crevel was a trembling creature. He trembled from head to toe, painfully, I should add. Whatever the breeze, or tempest that caused it, I knew full well that this trembling was permanent, that Gravel could never stop shaking. He was born rebellious as others are born with blue eyes. Even his laugh, so tremendous, so tragic, so unbearable, was a revolt. Intense and quick, Gravel rebelled against those around him as soon as he began to think. I didn't know them well, but his family's behavior was enough to make him furious. 
And I think that the friendship he showed me ever since our first meeting was triggered because he learned my family was like his and I too had not been able to resist rebelling. He was an insurgent, likable, pleasant, and always anxious to please. He was also contradictory. He was willing to mingle with impossible people, including unbearable snobs. He had no wish to forego his amusements and he felt no shame for this dubious company. I know well now that what he saw in these associations was quite naturally the chance to rebel and to express his rebellion. I often saw him arrive fuming at evening or rather nighttime events he craved nightlife and where he was sure to meet creatures that horrified him and yet armed with his smile he would show them the utmost kindness. I apologize for writing this word which must nonetheless be used in the case of Crevel. But as soon as he had the chance, and sometimes even when he didn't, he would explode and resume trembling with indignation. What I'd wish him to be known for, having observed him many days, is the way, despite his nonchalance and apparent detachment, he remained one of the most honest men of his time. I didn't share all his tastes, and I admit I sometimes fled some of his more offensive friends. I don't want to say more, but I knew them. But he certainly liked danger. And without bragging or boasting, he sought the derangement of all the senses. He did suffer terribly, and despite all the friendship that I, myself, and others bore him, we never succeeded in averting his suffering. He had a gift for suffering, and he knew it. But this knowledge didn't prevent his pressing forward with all his nervous energy, useless to tell him that he was wrong to violently want to be right. His smile, and still more his laugh, illustrated his faculty for suffering, and though I scarce dare write it, his will to suffer. I remember one evening, I met him at some friends. To my great surprise, since I had learned the same day that he had heard from a suspect source, not about the death of one of his dearest friends, but of his ruination in a highly nasty situation. As soon as I entered the studio where we were meeting for a drink, I heard Cravel's laugh. And all evening he laughed himself breathless, and I couldn't help listening to the laugh, which was truly peculiar. He caught sight of me and not surprisingly reported, I knew, he simply told me, I don't dare leave. And he walked off to go and laugh horribly in the corner where the dreadful people were joking. A few days later, I learned he was sick and wanted to be absolutely alone. I saw him again a month later, but he would not share his sadness with me. He had already set out, hands clenched, lips chapped, dark circles under his eyes for the abyss that lay in wait for him, its jaws wide open. Gravel was indeed one of those of whom it can be said that they have lost their illusions, but it did not make him bitter. He knew how to amuse himself, especially about human beings. He was indignant at their weaknesses, yet he rejoiced in their peculiarities and his admiration for madmen still more, perhaps, for mad women, was extreme. He took pleasure in the company of the cranks and dreamers who were happily fairly numerous in Paris. In this realm, he was eclectic, but he knew how to shrink them, the way that Indians shrink heads of the dead. I believe at a certain point in his life, he even collected those he called extraordinaries. He preferred to meet them at night because he claimed, after twilight, they were more sure of themselves. When he was alone, he was happy to write letters. His handwriting, oversized for his age, was quick and cheerful. Should we hope that someone collects and publishes all the letters he wrote? Even though I am personally opposed to this kind of posthumous exhibitionism, I think one could publish some of the dedications with which he generously embellished his books in the guise of explanations. All the same, he preferred the telephone. The role the telephone played in Gravel's life is hard to appreciate. But it was important. Gravel felt the need to stay in contact with his people, his friends or his strange companions, but also to always clarify his thinking. No sooner had he ended a conversation than he'd ring up to explain at length exactly what he had meant to say. If I harp on this proclivity for the telephone, which is not so rare today, it's because it seems to me to illustrate René Cavell's determination never to leave his friendships at a standstill. 
He couldn't bear not to clear up misunderstandings. And sometimes, because a misunderstanding wasn't cleared up as he wished, he didn't hesitate to fall out, as he put it. But more than misunderstanding, he hated indifference or neutrality. He pushed people to the wall, but wouldn't let himself be cornered. He was ready, moreover, to suffer the consequences of his behavior. But it would be wrong to think that these demands were hard to accept. Gravel knew the secret of being both intransigent and affable at the same time, harsh and engaging, and for some, fascinating. Rene Gravel's charm has been much discussed, perhaps too much. This vague word, overused and randomly bestowed, does not convey the radiance of the man Gravel. I've asked many of his friends to try to define it, and none could do so. They gave me a lot of reasons, but they all seemed too vague to remember. All I wish to recall is that from the moment you saw Gravel or spoke to him, you knew you were in the presence of someone different. And I use this word in its strongest sense. He was, it's easy to say now, determined to direct his destiny so as not to succumb to the facet, the banal in literary milieus, to success at any price. But he was capable of dangerously grazing these rocks. Rereading his books is enough to recognize the risks he liked to run. However, he seemed to want to renounce the tightrope walker's poise in asserting himself to shake off the weight of all he had agreed to carry until then. After all, the books he published as fast as he could were only dubious reflections of himself, and I'm convinced that he didn't want to attach too much importance to them. He even gladly forgot them, and I had the impression that for him the books were bottles thrown into the sea. He was not a man of messages, nor of calls to action. He preferred experimentation. And I believe he took delight in considering his novels in particular, not as finely tuned, but as trials. Furthermore, thanks to surrealism, he discovered a realm of wide open spaces that he traveled through alone. He didn't have the time to continue his explorations, but I'm certain it was with this activity he would want primarily, he would primarily want to be remembered for. Thanks a lot.